Yeah. Now it's me. Hello, the hangout. Um, hey. Dan, you going? Um, we've got five people with us from around the world. Uh, say hello first. Kevin in Toronto. Hey. We've got Justin in Florida. Hello, world. Uh, Tamara in Malaga. Hi. <laughs> Oh, Mario, you look different there. Let's say it again. Tomorrow, right. say hi. Ah, sorry. <laughs> there we go, that's tomorrow. Now it's my question, no? Yeah, no, not yet. Sorry. <laughs> my first question is um, at, why, at uh, what age you became to produce? Oh, no, tomorrow, you're jumping the gun. One second, one second tomorrow. Ah, okay. We've got Will in Newbury. Hi, guys. Ah, uh, OK, OK. Hey, Sorry. we've got Chris in California. There we go. Cool. So we're going to kick off with some questions. Um, Kevin, uh, in Toronto, have you got a question for me? OK, OK. So um, first, I just want to like, address it. It's a common issue. Uh, it's Kevon, not Kevin. Oh, Kevon. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I, I get that a lot. Okay, so my first question: um, Out of all the labels that like you've you've come across, uh, why did you decide to join Hospital? It's a good question. Um, when I was, I guess you have to kind of go back a little while, ten years or so. Um, I'd released music on a bunch of more labels, and some of them kind of bigger ones as well. But to be honest. Everything about the way that hospital ran their outfit was was really appealing to me. Um, the artwork, the kind of concepts behind the releases. Um, when I spoke to um, Chris and Tony, they came from a very kind of similar musical background to me as well. Um, but more than anything, the music that they were releasing um, was it was just coming from the same place um, and. So when they kind of invited me down for the meeting, it just made, it made complete sense. Um, I think when you're looking at a label, it, it's all about the kind of stuff that they release, their ethos, um, and how good a fit that is for you. And personally, hospital was kind of spot on, really. Oh, that sounds nice. That's great. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Justin, have you got? Have you got? Um, have you got a question? All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I've I've been listening to your music for years. I I, I really love the energy you've got there, and uh, a lot of your songs you you work with uh, great vocalists. And and I always wondered about the process. Um, do you, you know, does someone come to you with vocals and you build a song around that, or do you you just get a like but up up in your head and start start building from there? Like like how do you make a song? I guess everyone's different, every tune is different. Um, certainly with this album, um, the only real kind of full vocal track was Tides, uh, and that started off as an instrumental, knew that I wanted a vocal for it, um, invited Lily up to the studio, and we spent the day together, and um, she kind of she had some ideas, and we did a bit of writing together, and then recorded everything there and then. Um, with my last album, The Wise of Pictures, which was full of vocals, uh, I actually approached that in an entirely different way. Um, it, was, it was kind of new to me, but it was just something that seemed to make sense at the time, which is that I, uh, I wrote a load of sketches, I gave the sketches to uh, the vocalists, sat down with them and wrote and recorded um, a song, and then deleted all the music sat down with just the vocal and then wrote brand new music around that vocal. So I had a vocal that was kind of based on chord patterns that I liked, um, but in deleting the music, you let the vocal kind of take priority and let the vocal lead where the tune goes. Um, it's really difficult with vocals, especially if you put a vocal onto a tune afterwards, it's really hard to get those two things to kind of to gel together. Um, often uh, you end up with a vocal that's kind of crowbarred into the tune. 
Um, also, so often people put vocals on tunes that they think are big. So you've got a really big, strong instrumental track, and then you try and kind of squeeze a vocal into into it afterwards, which which doesn't always work. Um, I'm always kind of trying to get to really kind of work together, sit together, and, and kind of work together as one. You know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, all right, thank you. No problem. Tamara. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, what age were you when you began to produce? Um, it was, it's a long line. Like, I, I started making music when I was seven years old. Um, that was kind of playing the piano. I started making music with computers when I was 16, and then I started making drum and bass when I was 18, which okay. all of a sudden is a, a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Will. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Um, wh what I want to know is, um, there are quite a few young guys who are either DJing or they're just kind of getting into production and it's going to be a long road. What is there anything that you think that they should really try and do now to best prepare them for the world of electronic dance music production? I think don't be kind of don't expect the world to fall at your feet very quickly. Um, you do places where people kind of explode and and here on the scene, apparently, you know, aged 17 years old, and it all happened immediately. Often, there's um, there's a lot of work that goes into it before that. Uh, my granddad once told me that an overnight success takes seven years, and I think that's a good bit of advice. I think there's a similar thing about how many hundred hours or thousands of hours of practice that goes into making, you know, like a, yeah. an artist or a musician or whatever. But I think for me. It, you can tell when someone's done their, their groundwork. You know, when you play the house parties, you warmed up at small parties, you know, you work way up to playing you know, bigger sets at small parties and then warming up at big parties and all of that stuff's really important. You learn so much. You learn so much from playing at house parties and people can actually shout at you if they don't like doing the same. <laughs> yeah, you can do it. <laughs> you know? Whereas when you're DJing in a club you don't often get that kind of feedback. And when you're warming up in a small club, you learn how to um, you learn how to play, uh, you learn how to play kind of deeper sets, early sets, late sets, all that stuff's really important. You know? Um, so okay, cool. So basically, put 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 in the work, um, and don't worry too much about immediately trying to make it. You know, just try and get all the work in and try and get all the experience you need. Only craft. Make loads of music, play loads of steps if you're a DJ, you know, that, all of that stuff is really important. As a, as a producer, the most important bit of advice is make as much music as you can. Yeah. Every piece that you make, every tune you make, you learn something and you improve, you know, um, and don't expect immediate results, you know. It, it takes a long time um, before, well, certainly, personally, it took me a long time before I was doing things kind of with any... Um, a reasonable quality. Um, I remember a while ago, I was sitting on a and somebody sent me a tune, and I hadn't spoken to them, but didn't know who they were. This a tune, um, they, they have some feedback on this. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'll have a listen to it. And while I was, while I was downloading, he said, um, it's, not, it's my first tune, um, I got a reason three hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I got some detailed feedback on, on that. Um, so, was it any good, or was it, <laughs> was it a little bit? It sounded it sounded like someone who had um made it three hours ago. Music for three hours, you know. Yeah. Hold back a bit. Don't upload everything to SoundCloud. Um, you know, just I think just take time to hone your craft. I guess some of it is about confidence, isn't it? It's being confident that you 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 are you do know what you're doing and taking your time over it rather than trying to rush and. It's true, and actually, as far as kind of, it's, it's a more, I don't know, this is kind of further down the line, but actually, one of the 
the production is knowing when to stop, when to kind of when's enough. You know, it's easy to keep on piling ideas into a tune. Oh, you okay? Like when when to stop fiddling with it? Like when at the, the moment when it's actually yeah, when you've got enough elements, you have to be kind of confident and brave to write a tune that has beat, bass, and you know maybe a couple of effects and a little bit of music. I think. At the start, they tend to really kind of fill in the tune, try and make it sound huge. Um, but actually, if you're a good producer and if you're confident enough, then um, you're, yeah, you're brave enough to write something that's more stripped back. Okay, cool, great, thanks. No problem. Chris, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. Yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this with us. No problem. Um, yeah, so my, my question is, I guess, similar to, to Will's in terms of beginning on a project or beginning on a on kind of this this journey in, in music. Um, so when you when you are first starting to approach a track, um, do you ever just work on your sound design and your samples? Um, for the sake of doing that, or do you always begin something with a very specific track or album concept in, in mind? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I, I, I know there's a lot of people out there that, that like to kind of create banks and banks of samples um, before they do anything, and I can understand why people do that, but it, it's not something that I've ever personally done. Um, I'm always kind of hunting for samples and breaks and things like that, and I do collect those just add, as I go along, um, but generally, if I find something good, I want to use it, so I'll, I'll start something. Um, I think with the new Logic album, Matt and I did a good kind of three or four days of, of sampling, um, both for ideas and kind of actual sound, right at the very start of the project, and then I spent a day sorting those out, chopping them, trimming them, and things like that, um, and then you use those for the whole project. With this one, I did a couple of small sampling sessions, um, but generally, what happens is I'll find a sound and I'll be excited to use it, and then I'll go straight in and start working with it. Does that answer your question? Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thanks. Cool. Wicked. Well, so that's our first round of questions from my hanger outers. Um, we've got some questions from Twitter, which my beautiful assistant is holding up for me. Um, what's the most powerful production tool that you use? That's from DJ Fumo. Fumo? Fumo? Fumo. Okay. Most powerful production tool. Mm, I guess with any producer, it's your ears, you know? Um, no matter what equipment you work with, what software you work with, it's your, your ears. Your your ideas. That's kind of where it all comes from. That's kind of a cop out answer, I guess. Uh, if we're talking about proper software or hardware, um, Ozone from Isotope, uh, like a pack of um, plug-in effects. Uh, this is a bit dry. If you don't if you produce music, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I use those a lot. They're really useful. Um, I won't bore you with that. Information. Um, next question from Twitter, uh, from Coates. That's very formal. Um, what's your favourite song to relax to? Um, favourite song? I don't know. I couldn't pick. Kind of go. I go down to one song. As far as albums, like relaxing albums, um, either Jose James or Cinematic Orchestra. That kind of thing. Um, that tends to be the sort of stuff that I listen to when I'm um, when I'm reacting. Yep. There we go. That's that one. And then finally, um, Victor, what are some of your favourite tracks to drop to party? I'm wondering if Victor might be from Austria or Germany. To drop at a party. Um, uh, Death Sport has it. Tends to go down well. Um, a bit grimy. Uh, Lightning, the new album, one of my favourite things to play. Also, back to you. I've been really getting into kind of playing slower sections. 
Um, in my sets, we kind of 150, 155, 160. Um, from a base is normally 174, 175. Um, so, yeah, just slowing down, kind of getting some variety in there as well. Uh, cool. I hope that answers your question, Victor. Um, so, we're going to move on to another round. You guys. Kevin, Kevin, forgive me. Sorry. No, you got it. It's a whole it's a whole lifetime of being used to saying Kevin. It, it takes me a little while to get used to Kevin. Sorry. Yeah, I it's, it's all right, don't worry. Okay. So um I've noticed that like just hanging around other people that I'm like influenced um through like a lot of um, other musicians, other producers, and that's how like I'm a producer myself, like a drum and bass producer just upcoming, I guess. And um, I noticed that my uh, sounds like are a lot influenced from like other producers like Everwood and some of your songs as well. So I'm just wondering, um, when you're producing your music, uh, what are your influences? I try really hard not to be influenced by other drum and bass. It's kind of impossible because everything you listen to kind of goes goes in somewhere. Occasionally, I'll be in the studio making a tune and I'll be really happy with it, and then I kind of listen back to it half an hour later and I'll realise that it's actually ripped. Yeah, somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So you're saying you try you try to go for original sounds always, or? Oh yeah, yeah. I I I don't know. Personally, I don't find the kind of appeal in making tunes that deliberately sound like somebody else. Um, like I said, it's inevitable. The producers that I respect and and whose music I love, I on on um on my sound. But I try and take um, influence from outside of drum and bass. So whether it's kind of contemporary production, um, more often than not, it tends to be from kind of older music, seventies uh, mm. soul, funk, jazz. Um, Library music, if you're familiar with that, that's kind of music that was written to the TV and radio, um, never commercially released. But it tends to be really amazing musicians um, making music kind of with no target. Um, Will, you keep, very chair. you keep popping up on the screen. Every time you move, Sorry. you're screwed the chair. I'll try, and, I'll try and stay really still. <laughs> Stop moving, please. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, yeah, basically, Kevin, Kevin, um, I try and take him from all over the place. Does that answer your question? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, dude. Thank you very much. Not at all. Justin. All right. Hey, yeah, thanks. So mm. I, I, I was curious to know, because I know so much, uh, it, you spend time making music in a studio, but you also go out to, to, to clubs and, and perform. And I'm, I wondered, which do you think is your strength, or do you feel like you're more of a performer, or do you feel like you're more of a studio artist? Hmm. Uh, I think I'm a studio artist that performs. Like my simple answer. Um, certainly, I don't know, if you see me DJ, I'm not the world's most charismatic person behind the stage. Or on a stage, rather, I'm not Steve Aoki. Um, completely. Uh, I don't know. I just like. I love making music. I love playing music. For me, the natural extension of, of the production. Um, one of the main reasons that I love making music is so that I can play it. And like, I make music that I want to play. Like if I'm, I'm DJing. And I realised that there aren't enough tunes to do this, whatever it is. And I go to the studio and, and try and make tunes to do that, you know. Um, I think if I had to choose, I'd find it impossible though. That I I just need music in the studio, I would miss the game so badly. And if I just DJ, I go crazy because I have to make music. I guess the production side is probably the more Essential thing to me, but uh, I love DJing so much that I I um I really struggle. All right.
Thank you, and um, and and please come to Florida sometime. I'll hook you up. <laughs> it's been a long time. I'm hoping to get out of the states uh, very soon. I don't know if I'm going to Florida, and it's been a long time. I can't remember. I think it was Orlando and Miami last time. Where about you in Florida? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too far from Orlando. Uh, that would be great. Cool. <laughs> All right. Take care. Um, Tamara, you have another question for me? Yeah. My second question is in which DJs or producer has inspired you to, to make uh, drum and bass music? Um... I guess going way, way back, um, the first stuff that I was really into was the Bristol stuff. Full Cycle, Ronnie Side, DJ Die, Big Crust, um, and Brian G, Jumping Jack Frost, the guys who kind of played the music. Um, that was the first drum and bass that I heard and loved. But at the same time, Metalheads. Goldie, huge influence. Um, having a great writer, a really important book as well. Um, I guess those are there's a lot of names. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but those, those are the first people. Okay. And when you are, when are you are you going to come to Spain? <laughs> I don't know. I, I never come to Spain. Um, well, it's not true. I've been to Madrid. I can't remember when I asked him, but it was a long time ago. It's funny that there's not a, a huge amount of drum and bass in Spain, is there? What? There, there isn't a lot of drum and bass in Spain? Yeah, yeah. Where in Spain are you? Malaga? Yeah, in South, South Spain, Andalusia. Do you really drum and bass in Malaga? Yeah. Yeah? Do you get visitors, international DJs? Yeah. Like uh, Wilkinson, like Andy C. Okay, big name. And you know, we're missing you here. I'm, I'm not big enough to play in Malaga. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. No problem. Mm. Will. Hey. You got um, so, so you're you're from a famously from a family of drum and bass heads. Um, what's it like? What was it like growing up in that family, and then and then moving into the even bigger family of hospital records? And um, what do you think? Where do you think you'd be without? Because I'm sure they've influenced you a lot in the direction you've taken. So where do you think you'd be if it wasn't for all that influence? Do you think you'd be doing this or doing something completely different, or do you think you'd have ended up doing very similar kind of stuff? It's difficult, you know. If, if everything was different, what would you be doing? <laughs> yeah, it's a really hard question. <laughs> to answer. Um, I know that if I wasn't kind of producing and DJing like I am, then I'd be doing something with music. Um, if I wasn't doing something with music, then I'd be doing something with technology, um, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it's, I'm growing up in the family. It, I'm very lucky in that both my parents are artists, like visual artists, and so. Um, so creativity was like top of the priority list in my house. Um, was was there a lot of competition between you and the other members of your family? Not at all. Was it was it much more kind of? It's not the kind of relationship that we have. We're we're all very close. So I'm one of four brothers. Yeah. Um, then you've got I'm the oldest. Then you've got logistics, who's next, and then other records, and then Temple, who's um, a visual artist. So. Um, Four boys, we're all really, really close, really, you know, we get on really, really well, we hang out together. Um, so the fact that we're brothers is, you know, is kind of a by the by, we're just, we're just four really, really close friends. Um, and so, kind of friendly competition, maybe, yeah. um, but at the same time, actually, nothing gives me more pleasure than the success that my brothers have achieved. Um, we all get a kick out of each other's achievements, you know? So it's it's not like we look at each other and go, you know, I want to be there or I want to do that. Um, it is always difficult. I mean, if you imagine having a friend who does the same thing as you, 
and inevitably there's you know like, remixing. Maybe I get I get remixes that Matt doesn't get that he'd like to do. He gets to play gigs that I don't get to do. You know, there's always a bit of that. Yeah. It it's never anything that kind of causes problems between us. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I don't take it for granted. Like I'm hugely lucky to have grown up firstly in a creative family because that that's where I swear ninety percent of it comes from, and like in a family that that. Um, respects like the choice to go down a creative path because I, I know that there's a lot of people that grow up in families where that, that wouldn't be an acceptable choice, you know, but my parents value creativity about, about just about anything to be honest. Um, and then also to have, have brothers that I'm so close to is amazing um, and that are into creative stuff as well. It's, it's even better. I think my parents would probably have uh, less sleepless nights if their children were, were all like lawyers and doctors, though. <laughs> well, good. But there you go. It's the price you pay. Cool. Yeah. Well, it sounds brilliant. Cheers, Will. Chris. Yeah. Uh, my second question was. Um, so the the music scene I would say in the UK is is different than than in California and one, one thing I love about the internet is how you're able to to share to share music share share your stuff like on an international level instantly but um, do you have any suggestions for building more of a more of a local um, uh, I guess Following, um, even if you are from an area that um, the the music scene is just a little bit different, does that make sense? Yeah, it's it's difficult, um, and I, and I have to say it's not something that I have experience of because when I started out, I think I had an email account, but um, like the internet was very very different, um, so. When I kind of first started producing, you you built your fan base in such a very very different way. Um, I guess the big thing is always just kind of getting out there, whether it's playing at local parties. You're in California, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Uh, in a in one of the big cities, or or kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, from San Diego. Oh. Yeah. Well, they've got a good scene. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I guess just, just try and get yourself warming up for parties if you're not doing that already. Um, it's all about just kind of making yourself available, being eager. Um, up to a point, you don't want to kind of become a pest. Um, but, you know, just get out there, play as many shows as you can. Um, like I was saying earlier on, be wary about putting all your music, if you're producing, putting all your music online right at the very start. Um, a lot of labels aren't going to be particularly interested in, in signing a tune that's been online for the past year and a half, you know? It, it, it just doesn't work that way. But, um, you know, just explore all the different avenues that there are. Um, good luck. Thanks. All right. No problem. So we've got some more Twitter questions. We do. Uh, so VGM, is that the name? Yeah, VGM. says, would you tell me where your name comes from? Uh, so this is well documented. Um, it's actually, uh, I viewed it on the wall of a, uh, a bathroom, a toilet in Washington. <laughs> Um, and it had a, a Newtone extraction fan. Uh, they are America's finest manufacturer of toilet extraction fans and home intercom systems and doorbells. Uh, and I just like the way it looked. So, um, so I, I stole it. And I've been stuck in it. <laughs> That's one good bit of advice. Use your name carefully and make sure that you like it. Make sure that it works on the internet. It doesn't come up with something completely random. Logistics, for example, is... Horrible if you're trying to search. 
Um, who's your favorite ambient producer? Joe C. I, I don't know that I have a <laughs> In all honesty, that's one music genre that I don't think I've ever sat down uh, and and listened to. Sorry, Joe. Um, and what are your thoughts on sampling in music? And that's by Own Glow. Uh, I'm guessing that's not your real name. Um, what are your thoughts on sampling in music? Uh, it's great. Um, I've been doing it for years. Uh, I'm more careful these days not to... Um, sample thing, sample something that's going to kind of get me into trouble. Um, what I tend to do these days is is recreate samples. Um, there's actually a, a cool little future music video um, that I did about recreating samples, changing them into something that kind of you can own yourself. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's it's what this music is built on. It, if I'm totally honest. I'm not a huge fan of the whole um, kind of, I don't know, there's a lot of people that do unauthorized remixes, bootleg remixes, and then put them online for free download. Um, and sometimes, you know, it works. Sometimes they go go on and do big things. But a lot of the time, for me, it kind of it feels a bit cheap. Um, if that's all you do, certainly, uh, which you know, I know that happens. Um, it's cool to do every once in a while. I do the old bootleg for fun. Um, but, yeah, I do like one every six months or year, maybe, tops. So, um, yeah, some things, it's, it's important. It's, it's, it's what this music was built on. So I believe, I believe we're, 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 we're there. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity <laughs> all of the beautiful artwork for my album, um, created by that youngest brother that I was talking about, Mr. Penfold. Uh, um, oh, right, is that true? Okay. Yeah, that was him. Um, and Rick, he, uh, Tim, Ricky, and I kind of came up with the, the whole layout and design, but this bit is, is all Tim. Um, that's out now. Uh, you can get it on the hospital shop, iTunes, Google Play. Yeah, I think I've covered all the bases there. Um, and if I know some of you, well, you guys, are um, spread out all over the shop, but anybody who is anywhere near London on the 20th of November, so next Friday, come down to the album launch. There's Get that. on there. I'm going to be there. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, that's next Friday, uh, North London, really cool little intimate club. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, is it right you're doing a you're doing a four hour set there? Is I am. Right? I am indeed doing a four hour set. What have you What have you got planned for that? Is it just have you got anything special lined up? Anything exciting coming? That we can listen out for? Lots, lots and lots of music. <laughs> um, I I kind of I like to dig anyway, but uh, I'm doing a lot of digging um, in preparation cool. for, for this. Um, and just with the whole kind of future history thing, I'll be playing across the board from kind of the past 20 years of DMB basically. Cool. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. It'll be great. I can't wait. I, I can't wait. Rick, who's my MC, I don't know if he would say exactly the same thing because he's going to have to chat on the mic. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, but no, it's going to be wicked. Um, check the hospital Facebook page, Newtown Facebook page. Um, there's information about the launch party on, on um, both of those. But um, Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for, for hanging out. Thank you, everyone on Twitter um, and Facebook for the questions. Um, it's been wicked. Cool. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. See you. Hmm. Up all around. Big up, guys. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> <laughs>